Hey, hey, and welcome back to Pianist Academy and to this masterclass where we take a specific piece of repertoire and elevate your playing to the next level. Today we're talking about Debussy's Reverie, and this piece is a gorgeous piece of music. So you're probably very familiar with this piece, but I'm going to start from the top and I'm going to play a little bit for you anyway. Uh, and then we'll get into talking in a lot of detail about what's going on here. So here is from the beginning of Reverie. It's a great stopping point. So first off, uh, I am using here on my iPad the Dover edition, which is actually, so I actually even got the book right here. I've had this book for probably 20, more than 20 years. I've compared this to the Henley Urtext edition, and from what I can see, there's only one marking that's missing, and it's actually kind of an important thing, so we're going to start by talking about that first off, first off, right away today. And that marking is right at the top of the page, uh, into the third bar. We really need a tie here between the bars. There's a tie in every other bar. I mean, you can see them all over the place, right? Anytime we have that B flat, it is sustained after its first attack in the first bar. So it would be breaking the composition up and it would be breaking everything else that Debussy establishes. I chose to use the Dover edition partly because I have read off this exact copy for my entire life that I have known the piece. Uh, but also because it is so close to the Henley edition, and the Dover edition is available for free on IMSLP, so you can just go over there. I'll even leave a link in the description below for you to download it if you'd like to read along with this specific copy. It's only missing that one marking, which we've just added now, right? Let's start off by talking about the tempo marking itself. Now, in this copy, we have this kind of strange marking at the top of the page, and that simply means andantino. Andantino. So Andantino means a little bit faster than Andante, slower than Moderato, if we look, if we talk about it in, in a technical sense. Andante is a walking pace. Andantino is like a faster walking pace. Now, Andantino is an Italian word, and there are some other Italian markings throughout the score, but then Debussy used those in combination with other French markings in, in a lot of his music. So then we have this additional marking, sans lenteur which means without slowness. Now, the, the interesting thing about these markings is that if you go and listen to recordings from Debussy himself to many, many concert pianists playing this piece, I have found that they fall into a general range of about 
70 beats per minute on the very, very slow end to about 92 beats per minute on the quick end. Now, 70 is slower than Andante. 92 is faster than Andantino. So <laughs> they, go, they go across a pretty wide gamut of tempos. And also, Debussy himself, if we take out all of the rubato that he adds to his playing, I think averages something around 80 beats per minute. It's very hard to tell exactly what tempo he's taking because there is so much push and pull. Okay, but this is a great place to start. Andantino, a walking pace without too much slowness. Now, let's add that to the fact that the title of this piece is Reverie, which is also an English word. And Reverie means a dream or a daydream, having a dreamlike quality. So we just keep that word in mind, dream or dreamlike. That's going to go a long way toward aiding us in our interpretation, right? Maybe you already, you probably already knew that. That's what reverie means. Uh, even just think about what a reverie is in English, if, you, if you're a native English speaker, okay? So we have this dreamlike music, if you will. Let's contrast that with the fact that we know Debussy hated being called an impressionist. He didn't like the term, he didn't, he didn't like the connotation. A lot of people have a tendency to play this completely with one pedal down. With, here's with the melody. And this entire time there's no lift. There's no lift of the pedal until our change of harmony. Right? And this bar. Now, that sounds very impressionistic, and it sounds very dreamlike. But knowing what we know about Debussy and how he hated being called an impressionist, is that what he would have really wanted? Now, we, can, we know the answer is absolutely no, and we're going to visit that in a second. But combining everything, the, the, the modern interpretation, along with what we know about Debussy's own writings and his, his quotes, why? Why do we need to play everything with one pedal? Everything with one pedal is the typical way to play French Impressionist music. A lot of blur. This sounds almost like just haze rolling over the countryside. Very amorphous, very ambiguous, right? We can't really tell. I like to think in, in images and shapes and colors and pictures, scenes, if you will. And so I would paint a scene that's, we're, we're not exactly sure, maybe I, I, I could say this is a countryside, but we're looking out of a window and it's, it's very foggy. Maybe it's the early morning, the sun is just coming up. Maybe it's the middle of the afternoon and there's been a rain, rainstorm, but we're left with a lot of fog in the atmosphere and things are just, that would be a scene I would go with. Or we could go with simply an emotional state which does a similar thing, right? Maybe we're lost in our thoughts, which is typically what a daydream is, right? Are we lost in our thoughts? Are we thinking kind of about one thing in particular? Are we lamenting something? Are we regretting something? Are we looking forward to something in this wandering state of mind? Which direction are you going to take the emotion? Right? Those are all good questions. Because we know that Debussy actually wrote this piece when he was feeling very depressed. He's quoted as saying it was one of the most depressed periods of his life. There's a great underlying reason to interpret this in a more somber state. And on the slower side of Andantino, there's a great reason to do that because Debussy might have been feeling feelings like that himself. But it's also open to interpretation, and that was one of the things, like we talked about earlier, that was such a prominent part of music in the time of Debussy is that everybody could and was expected to put their own interpretation upon it, right? So I've given you a handful of different examples thinking about painting a scene, thinking about an emotional state of mind, thinking about 
what Debussy was feeling like maybe when he wrote this, knowing a little bit of history, knowing his problem with needing to pay bills and being anxious about that. And also quotes that we have him saying that he was feeling very, very depressed when he wrote this piece. That can all play into our interpretation, right? It doesn't have to only be something that responds to the title, something that responds to this dreamlike quality. That can be our starting point, and we can go from there and add something else to it, right? Let's take a minute and listen to the opening of Debussy himself playing this. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about what we've heard. So first off, I think it's very obvious the immense amount of rubato, push and pull, throughout phrases and throughout all kinds of his playing, right? In a sense, the timing is somewhat directionless, right? The timing is wandering. We don't have these very straightforward phrases that make an arc from one point, the beginning, to the end of the phrase, but instead there's a lot of meandering. The other thing is the pedaling. If you listen really closely, you can actually hear where the pedal is moving, and you can hear just how clean Debussy's playing of this piece is. That brings us all the way back to Debussy not liking being called an Impressionist, right? Now, how can we interpret that? Can we interpret that in a way that fits with today's uh, modern ideas of how to play Reverie, but also make sure that we link it to what the composer, what we can hear, that he is doing with his own piece of music, that he is feeling with his own piece of music. So, throughout, Debussy is not, well, he's not completely isolating each pitch of the left hand. It is definitely not a single pedal put down that we go through and just continue to play through this kind of cloud of music, right? So maybe we can change our focus, especially because this is one of Debussy's earliest compositions. Mm -hmm. 